One of the great luxuries of doing Perry Mason is the scale of the production is enormous and vast. We get to explore LA in the 1930s with such a huge scope. History is crazier than a lot of things you can come up with. This season, the world was even more expansive. You don't have to suspend your imagination because you're actually in those moments. It feels like what it would have been at that time. I'm excited for people to see the world again. 1930s LA is struggling with dramatic impact of the Great Depression. During the Depression, people lost their jobs, their livelihoods, their homes. And for Latinos, this meant that they were scapegoated. The Gallardo case, to my mind, is not based on an actual case, but the circumstances of racial prejudice in the judicial system, of the downtrodden, are very familiar. Seymour. Walking into the 1930s courtroom was really moving. The scene is so stunning. They have the New Deal era murals on the wall. On one of the walls, it says, may truth stand with the people. It was transporting in time, but also really connected to the continuing work that we all need to be doing. One of my favorite sets continues to be City Hall, standing on the courtroom steps with 600 extras all dressed in period clothing. We'll give our extras stories. If somebody comes in and their ticket says, I'm a lawyer, and you look at them and you go, well, you obviously don't look like a lawyer, but you would be amazing as a reporter. Dress them as that. Recreating 1930s Los Angeles is a massive undertaking. In those big scenes, when you're in an enormous soundstage or in an incredible location, it's an immersive experience. There was one day with me and Perry on the dock, there was a huge green screen. It was the biggest green screen I'd ever worked on. I'm not too cool to be like, oh, is that how it's done? I loved Santa Anita. There's always something just so fun about being a producer and being on a show and getting to go to a place that no one gets to be at. The other thing that was interesting about Santa Anita is that when you shot in one direction, it was almost all from the time period. We had to remove some lights and stuff. We shot the other direction, you couldn't really use it because it was all modern. So we just sort of duplicated that first direction. The Hooverville is obviously incredible to turn up in the middle of the hills outside of LA and suddenly this whole shanty town has been placed there. There's a shot in the Hooverville of a blonde woman with braided hair in an apron pinning laundry on a clothespin. One of my team dressed her and I asked the ADs to put her where they did. It looked like the research that we'd put all over the walls. My biggest goal with the show was that you move into the world and it's real for you. And Los Angeles does have an oligarchic power structure. There are a small number of people who can wield extraordinary power. Camilla is based on a real woman of the time named Emma Summers. And Emma Summers was actually a piano teacher who took her money and invested it in oil wells and became a very, very wealthy woman. If Camilla was alive today, she would be a massive influencer. Why did you take this case? Maybe I like to stack odds. I always love a bad guy who has a reason, and Lydell really spoke to me. I think Paul Racy bringing him to life was deeply exciting. Lydell was based on Edward Doheny, an oil tycoon in Los Angeles, and he was one of the wealthiest and most powerful people. He's someone who made his wealth by brutally being in this oil business. It's what is required in Los Angeles to achieve success. Some of the estimates are that in the early 1930s, LA is producing a quarter of the world's oil. If you look at historical photographs and you look too quickly, you think you're looking at a forest of trees, but you're actually looking at countless oil derricks lining the landscape. Hello, Father. Brooks McCutcheon was based on Ned Doheny, the scion of Ed Doheny. Ned was murdered in the late 20s. We love that idea of someone who is so beloved and has a certain image in the city and what would happen if they were killed. It took a couple hours for the boys to give up a name. Perry, Paul, and Della are representing different aspects and different personalities within LA. All three of them are not part of this elite power structure that we see in season two. We worked and thought a lot about what is now the transition for Mason from season one clothing-wise. 
He's establishing himself as a respectable lawyer, but I wanted something always to be slightly off, like he's never truly comfortable. He should look slightly bad in a good suit. The wonderful thing about Matthew is that you could put him in the most expensive suit in the world, and because of his physicality, he can make it look crumpled and rumpled. Luckily, because of his size and frame, I was able to pull some real period suits from this time. Della has been around. She's had to fit in with a very male-dominated work environment and be respected. And I think clothing is one of the ways in that period Della has figured out that it's a way of commanding respect is to be impeccable. The buttoned-up blouse, the perfect brooch, the right hat. What's also really interesting is that when the actors are in these, they're wearing undergarments from the time period, which sounds like an odd little detail but it really affects how their body sits in something, especially a woman in a dress. She's deliberately trying to make a statement about being a woman in a man's world. And so I deliberately echoed suits from the era that had a bit more of a male vibe. And because Juliet is so feminine within herself, we were able to push that. Paul chooses his clothing because it's his identity. Clothing in the 30s, there was no fast fashion. You get a suit, that's your suit. And Paul knows that if he can walk around and allow his costumes to maybe lift his spirits more than he feels on the inside, that's a job that's still making him and his wife look a certain way in the community. It keeps his confidence up and it allows him to just be who he says he is. There was a very successful, thriving African-American middle class in Los Angeles at this time. In looking at the images, they dressed beautifully. There's the scene later on in the season where he challenges the local representative from the district. If you look carefully at that, Chris is actually better dressed than the representative. The representative doesn't have to worry. He's a white man living in a white man's world. Paul isn't. There's something about that world that really relaxed me. It's like, oh, those things are awful, but at least they're 1930. Now, granted, a lot of them were still being done in 2020. In order to shed light on a situation that we're facing in society today, great writers will go back and set their story in a previous time. You want to make sure that you're telling a story that is both true to that time, but also means something to our time. There are these people in this world, regardless of whether they're fiction or not, are willing to take those risks and do the right thing.